Chapter 8 once again is over rays and it's broken up into the following. This week it's one portion, the first portion is array basics, then we move into sequential searching of an array, then processing the contents of an array, parallel arrays, two dimensional arrays, and a brief little overview of three or more dimensional arrays. Now first in 8.1 we talk about array basics and arrays are just variables. You can think of them as special variables. Variables that type that stores a collection of similar or related items. And the book definition says allows you to store a group of items of the same data type together in memory. That's a really good definition. And using arrays just makes it more efficient sometimes rather than redeclaring the same type of variable over and over again and giving it different names like with employee 1, employee 2, and employee 3. Instead we can just have our array created and kind of give it a number as to the size of the array we want. Now, we don't always know the exact number of the size of elements that are going to be in our array and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now let's take a look right here and we're going to break this down a little bit. We've got declare string employees 50. And what we have here essentially is we have a string variable and our name of that variable we are giving it as employees and the size of our array is 50 elements. So in our program here we have 50 elements all of the same data type in a variable array called employees and we want this information stored in memory. And when this information is stored in memory, it is going to be sequentially stored based on our array size. Once again, our storage locations in our array are called elements. And each of these elements of our array has a unique number called a subscript that identifies where it's at, where it's stored. So our storage locations here those are right here. And our subscript that identifies is right down here. As we've mentioned before, typically in most language the subscript location is going to start with zero. We'll call that zero based. So if we are identifying our array size of five, we have zero, one, two, three, four as our locations, but there are five locations. And the location in memory that's reserved, like I said, will be sequential. So we're going to go here for this storage location, and our next storage location, which is for one, will be the very next block. Now we can assign our values individually, um, such as set numbers, give this element this value, and then I want you to go in and have my program set the value of 30 in our element for one. Or, But it's a lot more efficient to just use a loop and let that get that value assigned, let that get assigned as it's being stepped through the array. So let your, let, let your loop step through and assign those values. Now if you look at the figure here, 8-3 from the text, you'll see that this is a one-dimensional array because it can only hold one set of data in the array. And we'll talk about two-dimensional and three-dimensional later, but I just want to point that out here. And that if you look at this figure, it, pretty much just breaks down program 8-1 in your text. So as you look at that program and walk through it, you'll see that this figure here shows the contents of the array after the values are stored in it. Now arrays can be initialized as zero or they can be set to specific values as you see here where we have set the value of our days array to seven. You can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements for our array. Now if we try to assign a value to location seven, which doesn't exist because we have 
our 0 through 6 are our elements for our array size of 7, then what we would have is an off by 1 error because we've tried to exceed the boundaries of our array. I'll draw that for you here so you can see what happens. So we've said that our days array has a size of 7. This is going to be really rough. So we have our element 0 here. And in element 0 we have put in Sunday. And then we have element 1, which is Monday. As we move through and fill our array, here at the end we have our element 6, location 6, which has Saturday. Now if we try to put in a sign element 7, we don't have an element 7. Our computer memory is using that for other data and then we would have our off by one error. Hopefully that explains that a little bit clearer for you. Now sometimes you need to store a series of items in an array but you don't really know the number of items in that series and as a result you don't know the exact number of elements to declare for your array. One solution to this is just to make an array large enough to hold the largest possible number of items. And then this can lead to other problems. If the actual number of items stored in the array is less than the number of elements, the array will only be partially filled. So take a look at program 8-5 in your book and see how in that pseudocode um, we have a partially filled array there and just kind of look through those steps. And to avoid in processing the unfilled elements, we must have an accompanying integer variable that holds the number of items stored in the arrays. And with this one, the count variable holds the number of items stored in our array. The next topic we will cover in this chapter is the for each loop. Not all languages will provide this, but some languages will provide a for each loop. And the for each loop can simplify array processing when your task is simple enough to step through an array, retrieving the value of each element. In the example from the book, we have the following pseudocode here, which will just display at the end here, our loop, will just display all the values stored in the numbers array that were declared up here. You search for data that is stored in an array. And here we will look at sequential searching in an array. And a sequential search algorithm steps through the array beginning at the first statement and compares each element to the item being searched for. The search will stop when the item is either found or it reaches the end of the data. The pseudocode listed here ties to figure 8-5 just, just kind of goes over a sequential search logic and in this logic you can see that the search value is the value that the algorithm is searching for and when the algorithm finishes the found variable will be set to a value of true the next part of the chapter we talk about is processing the contents of an array and we talk about totaling the values in an array and calculating average in this section. And the loop steps through an array, adding the value of each array element to the accumulator using a accumulator variable. And when we go to average, we're going to then take that total and that is going to be divided by the size. You can see examples of each of these in program 8-9 for calculating the total value and then for calculating the average look at program 8-10.
You can then look at 8-11 for finding the highest values in array and 8-12 for finding the lowest values in a given array. A copying array can be done through using loops. In copying array you have to assign the individual elements of the array you are copying to the elements of another array as seen here. We are setting the second array values to whatever is in our first array. Now when we're discussing passing an array as an argument, uh, typically passing an array as an argument requires that you pass two arguments. And you can see that usually you pass the array and its size. Now you can look at the pseudocode in program 8-13 in your text which will show an example of a function that accepts an integer array as an argument. And the function will return the total of the array's elements. The next concept we look at is parallel arrays. And sometimes it's useful to store related data in two or more arrays. And here we can see that the names arrays stores the name of five people, and the addresses arrays stores the addresses of the same five people. That is what we can classify as a parallel array. Now if we were going to access this data at any point we would use the same subscript with both arrays to get the information for the same person. Next we move on to talk about our two-dimensional arrays. And our two-dimensional arrays, also known as 2D arrays, can hold multiple sets of data. Kind of think of these as um, having rows and columns when you're storing that. In the visual for this example, a teacher has six students. So we put those six students in these six rows, 0 through 5. And they have five tests, so 0 through 4 to represent our five tests. So our dimensional array is the data from our row and our column where they intersect. So here you can see that two size variables are required when declaring. So we have our integer rows, which is three, and integer columns, which is four here. And we have our values as rows in brackets and columns in brackets. So if we were going to access something, we could say like set values in row two. column 1, set that value to 95. So when we look at that, where the information can be put in our memory, we see that we're going to go to row 0, or row 2, column 1, and we are going to put in the value 95. So hopefully that illustrates for my values array that I have down here. I have illustrated how the subscripts for, each, for this element, that value has been placed in my array. Now, as I stated earlier, arrays can be three-dimensional or even more than three-dimensional. And if we look here at our array seats here, you could think of this as reading it as three sets of five rows containing eight elements.
sets. Once again, that's three sets of five rows containing eight elements. Then figure 822 here from our text is just illustrating the concept of a three-dimensional array as pages, as you see we have three individual pages here, of two-dimensional arrays with our rows and our columns. Now that's just a brief breakdown of chapter 8 over arrays, so now uh, hopefully that will help as you're reading through it and working through the programs as you get into working with Raptor this week. Once again, make sure that you watch the video with arrays for working with Raptor before you start working on your assignment for this week. Good luck.